من الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. so so إن شاء الله تعالى we're going to finish our sessions tonight. this is our tenth session of the Kitab al-Shifa by Qadi Iyad. I hope you benefited from this course, um, I hope you're inspired to learn more. Inshallah ta'ala, there's a lot of great literature out there um, on the topic of the, the Shema'il of the Prophet وسلم, the Sirah of the Prophet وسلم, um, the Khasa'is, the special unique qualities uh, of the Prophet وسلم, and of course this book uh, is is great because it's very comprehensive and really a combination of all three genres of literature. So you should have it at your house, even for barakah. Just have it on your shelf, pull it out every so often, and read a section of it. Inshallah ta'ala, Allah will bless you uh, and put the love of the Prophet وسلم, increase the love of the Prophet وسلم, uh, in your heart. So we are on section 19, um, chapter 2, part 1, uh, in my translation, page 68, the second full paragraph, that Anas radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet وسلم, used to ride a donkey and answer the invitation of the slave. So here, the section is again on the humility, the tawadu of the Prophet وسلم. In the battle against Bani Qurayda, he rode a donkey with a saddle cloth, which was haltered with a rope made of palm fiber. He said, uh, Anas said, that the Prophet ﷺ would be invited to eat barley bread and rancid butter and would accept such an invitation. He said that the Prophet ﷺ went on hajj on a shabby saddle on which was a fringed cloth that was worth four dirhams. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Allahumma hijjatun la riya fiha wa la sum'a. That the Prophet ﷺ said, and this hadith is mentioned by, or related by uh, Ibn Majah and others, that the Prophet said, Oh Allah, make it an accepted hajj with no riya, with no ostentation, with no showing off, or sum'a wa la sum'a, with no desire for reputation. So this is the Prophet ﷺ, this was his humility. When he conquered Mecca to Muqarramah, he entered it with the, with the armies of the Muslims. He bowed his head down while sitting on his conveyance, so that he nearly touched the front part of the saddle. His beard was almost touching the front part of the saddle out of humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this very powerful image of the Prophet ﷺ coming into Mecca during the conquest of Fatha Mecca, and a hadith in Bukhari tells us, Abdullah ibn Mughafil, he says that I saw the Prophet ﷺ on that day, and he was sitting on his camel, his she-camel, and he was coming into Mecca, and he was reciting Surah Al-Fatih, إِذَا جَاءَ نَسْلُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ which according to many of the exegetes of the Qur'an is the final complete surah of the Qur'an uh, revealed. Um, when the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, إِذَا جَاءَ نَسُوا اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسِ يَدْخُرُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ And you see humanity entering the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-Islam, um, the religion that was perfected by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the religion that he brought is called al-Islam. And you see mankind entering in throngs uh, by the dozens فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ And praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask His forgiveness. إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed is oft relenting, the one who is constantly turning towards us and accepting our tawbah. He is a tawab. That's why when we pray, we say, يَا تَوَّاب تُوب عَلَيْنَا O relenter, relent towards us. So this was his demeanor, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, coming into the conquest of Mecca. Again, this is a city that had kicked him out, that had persecuted him. Of course, he was raised in Mecca, so it had a place near and dear to his heart. 
Um, and when he came into the city, as we know, as we've said in previous sessions, he was well within his rights to extract vengeance uh, from those who had persecuted him. But he came into the city, and as we said, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Yawma, Yawm Al-Marhama, Yu'izzallahu Qurayshan. Today is a day of mercy, the exaltation of the, Qur of the Quraysh. And he came in, sitting on his camel, with his head bowed in humility, reciting Surah Al-Fatih. <clears throat> Qadi Iyad continues, one of his signs, one of the signs of his tawad or of his humility <clears throat> is that he said, do not prefer me over Yunus ibn Matta. So Yunus ibn Matta is the, the prophet and Nabi Yunus alayhi salam. And do not create rivalry between the prophets and do not prefer me over Musa alayhi salam. And then there's a hadith here, which is in Sahih Muslim, when someone said to him, Ya khair al bariya, O best of creation. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Thaka Ibrahim ﷺ." That is Ibrahim ﷺ. So, how do we deal with these hadith? Because it is absolutely um, a uh, cornerstone of our aqidah as Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah to believe that the Prophet ﷺ is the best of creation. Imam Al Laqani says in the Jahara al Tawheed that the Prophet ﷺ is Khair al Khalq Allah. So, how do we square this belief? which is absolutely essential with these hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu So Qadi Iyad actually says here that he's going to explain these hadith later, but we don't have time to do that because we don't have any more sessions, at least in this course. So I'll just give you some previews as, as to what he says the ulama do with these, with these hadith. So according to Qadi Iyad, either the Prophet Sallallahu did not yet know at this point when he made these statements, he did not yet know that he was Sayyidu Waladi Adam, that he was the master of the children of Adam. Um, and thus this uh, prohibition uh, occurred before his full knowledge of himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is one possibility. Another possibility is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is making these statements purely out of his tawadur, out of his humility, although this is debatable. Uh, the third um, uh, possibility is that it is simply cautionary, right? That if we make these, or if we insist, if we emphasize these disparities uh, between the prophets, then that could lead to a type of uh, diminution or a type of a lessening of the rank of some of the other prophets and could actually lead to a type of disrespect uh, of the other prophets. So we should simply be careful. Maybe this is the meaning of it, that it's simply precautionary. But at the end of the day, we know the reality. And the Prophet ﷺ explained the reality, that he is in fact the best of creation. He's better than any prophet. He's better than the Kaaba. He's better than Jannah. He's better than the Arsh and the Kursi. He's Khair al-Khalqillah, Khair al-Bariya. That the Prophet ﷺ is Sayyidu Waladi Adam, Wala Fakhr, he said, and I do not boast. And this is something that is absolutely essential in the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And also that the Prophet ﷺ is the universal messenger, that his sharia supersedes and cancels, abrogates all of the previous shara'ir. And this is also something that is essential. This is something that is grounded in the Quran, as we recited the Mithaq al Nabiyin. Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 81, you have some modern intellectuals who go by the name of perennialists, perennial philosophers who deny this aspect of the Prophet ﷺ, and they say that, that all of these covenants, all of these shara'ir, all of these sacred laws that were revealed before the Prophet ﷺ are not abrogated and that all of these religions are valid paths uh, to salvation, valid paths to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that one really does not need to even believe in the Prophet Sallallahu Even if one is exposed to a sound prophetic summons, even if someone met the Prophet Sallallahu and got to know him and knew the truth of his message, according to these perennial philosophers, that person can simply uh, res have respect for the Prophet, but continue worshipping Isa Alayhi as a Christian, continue believing in the Trinity, this is absolutely against the Qur'an. This is absolutely against the ijma' of all of the ulama according to Imam al-Ghazali, according to Imam al-Nawi, according to many, many others, according to the four madhahib, 
of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'a, uh, and that this is a considered a, a, a clearly deviant position. It, it trifles with the very first pillar of Islam, not the fifth pillar or the fourth pillar, but the very first pillar of Islam. The definition of a Muslim is La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And it's true. And the perennials point this out. What about in the Quran? Isa alayhi salam is called a Muslim. The Bani Israel are called Muslim. Ibrahim alayhi salam is called, yes, they were Muslim. They were Muslim at that time and their sharias were valid for that time. But when the universal messenger comes, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, when there comes to you a messenger confirming what is with you, do you believe in him and render him help? In other words, obey him. And all the messengers and their ummah, remember that Imam al-Razi said that, because this also includes the ummah of these previous messengers, and that's indicated by the very next ayah, chapter 3, verse 82, uh, that when this messenger comes, you must believe in him and render him help. Do you take this covenant as binding? And they said yes. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, uh, and, um, and I ratify this covenant, وَأَنَا مَعَكُمْ مِنَ shahideen, And I am amongst the witnesses. So the Prophet Sallallahu is the best of uh, creation and uh, uh, all, of the, all of the Prophets, all of the Prophets considered him, the Prophet Sallallahu to be uh, their master. Now continuing having issues with lighting here, um, please bear with the lighting issue. I don't know why that's happening. Maybe because the open window behind me has something to do with it. Okay, <clears throat> continuing inshallah ta'ala, that Aisha and Al-Hasan ibn Ali and uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and others described the Prophet sallallahu they said that he would uh, work in the house with his family, that he would, it says here, Qadi Iyad says he would delouse his clothes. Now this is an important caveat that the ulama point out here, that the Prophet Sallallahu did not have lice. He's not delousing his own clothes, that he's actually delousing the clothes of his companions. And this is something that the ulama again make clear. But he would mend his own sandals, he would serve himself, he would sweep the house, he would hobble his own camel. He would take the camels to graze and eat with the servants, he would knead bread with them and carry his own goods to the market. Uh, this is based on a hadith of our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. This is a hadith that's found in multiple books in different different wordings or versions of the hadith in Bukhari and Tirmidhi and others that the Prophet said that, that our mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was asked, Ma kana nabi yasna'u fi bayti? That uh, what did the Prophet, what was the Prophet doing? What did he used to do in the house? And the Prophet and, and Aisha said, Kana fi mihnati ahlihi. But the Prophet ﷺ was in the service of his family, the service of his household, doing these types of jobs, mending his own sandals, right? Mending his own clothes, you know, cleaning up the house. Um, the equivalent of men today in the house, you know, washing the dishes, mopping the floors, uh, vacuuming the house, uh, helping out with cooking. That's what the Prophet ﷺ was doing in his house. He was in the service of his family. I remember, I remember years ago, <clears throat> I was in a uh, Christian church, a Methodist church, and we were having an interfaith, a dialogue, and there was a female pastor, and she was an expert in the Old Testament, and she gave us like a 15-minute sort of tutorial on the Old Testament. And then afterwards, she asked her husband, she said, can you bring me a cup of water? And her husband went and brought her some water. And then another parishioner looked at me, and my wife was sitting next to me, and he said, that must be real culture shock for you. And at first I didn't know what they were taught, what he was talking about. What do you mean culture shock? So I kind of smiled, and, and then a few minutes later, I just I had to ask him, like, what do, what do you mean by that? And he said, you know, a, a husband serving his wife, isn't that kind of strange for someone from your culture, right? And certainly there are, uh, there are cultural, cultural aspects that are found in, in, in Muslim-majority countries that are problematic. Uh, but I explained to him that the Prophet ﷺ is our role model, and he's really the person that we're commanded to emulate. And I quoted this hadith, 
I so said, there's a sound hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where his wife was asked, and I say this many, many times, I said in many, many khutbas, no one knows a man better than his wife. You know, whatever type of persona, which really means mask in Latin, whatever type of mask or persona he's presenting to the public, the wife knows who's under the mask, right? So she was asked, Ma kana nabi fi what, what was he doing in the house? Kana fi mihnati ahlihi. Yani kana fi khidmati ahlihi. That he was in the service of his family. This is our role model. The Prophet sallallahu was a very fa'al person. He was very active, energetic, was not lazy, you know, wasn't complacent, very active, doing things, going somewhere. Fa'ina tadhabun. The great, one of the great questions uh, of the Quran that Allah will ask us. He was asking us, where are you going? What are you doing? How's your life going? We should be progressing every day. We should be better. One of my teachers said uh, that if you, if somebody says to you, Kayf al -hal, and you say, same old, same old, then you've, you've failed. You should be, uh, you should be uh, improving on a daily basis. Even learning one word, you know, open a dictionary, English, Arabic, whatever you want, Urdu, Spanish, and just learn one word. Increase your vocabulary. Increase your uh, ability to communicate effectively. You know, do something, do something around the house. Help, help someone around the house. Go out and do something for someone. Buy someone a gift. Always be active. Don't be lazy because life is short, right? And, you know, Imam Ghazali points this out. You know, if you live 60 years... In your life, um, which is about average, I mean, the Prophet Sallallahu said, the reaping of my ummah is bin as wa sab'in, is between 60 and 70. Most people of the ummah will die between 60 and 70. That he himself, Sallallahu Alaihi passed into the mercy of his Lord at 63 years old. So if you have a 60-year life and you sleep eight hours a day and you work eight hours a day, that's 40 years gone. So you have 20 years left, but you eat, you wait in line, you watch movies, you play on the internet, you engage with your social media, you know, whatever you do. Um, you're driving your car, some, some people drive in their car three, four hours a day. So what is really left in terms of study, of reflection, of worship, you know? Don't think to yourself, well, you know, I got a long life. Just put it off. It's okay. We'll do it later. We'll do it next year. We'll do it in 10 years. I'll do it when I'm 40. I'll do it when I'm 80. This type of thing. We should be active. Very, very active. I remember like yesterday, the Y2K scare. That was 20 years ago. 20 years gone. And I remember it like it was yesterday. You know, so be active. Kanafi mihnati ahlihi. Okay. A man came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A Bedouin came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, uh, Qadi Iyad is mentioning this now. That and this man began began to tremble out of awe. He was awestruck by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sayyidina Ali mentioned this earlier that when you first encountered the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you were awestruck by him. Right? It, was, it was quite an awesome experience, an awesome spectacle, because not only was, did he demand this, had this, had this sort of regal quality to him, but physically he was very beautiful as well, sallallahu alayhi wa But then he said when you get to know him, you begin to love him. So this Bedouin was trembling, and the Prophet said to him, he said, Hawwun alayk, like relax, take it easy. So inni less to be malik. And the hadith is in Ibn Majah that, that's related here by Qadi Iyad. That he, the Prophet said, I'm not a king. Now the Prophet is greater than a king. Right? He's better than a king. He's a Nabi. He's a Prophet. He's a Rasul. He's Khayr al khalkillah as we said. He's a master of children of Adam. He's the best of creation. So he's not a king, meaning that, you know, he's not a tyrant. Right? He's, he's not a tyrant. He's, 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 he's a Prophet. Right? Um, and so he has this type of humility. Innama ibn imra'atin ta'kuru al-qadid. So he said that I'm only the son of a woman who used to eat like dried meat, right? 
like like jerky meat. That's all I am. And again, and that's true, right? And that's that's who he is, Salallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he's he's not telling a lie to this man, right? Uh, but he's trying to calm the man down because the man understood uh, the, the the awesome presence before whom he was standing. Um, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from his tawadur, this is how he made the man relax, right? And this is from his from his humility. <clears throat> the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now that that's basically the end of the section nineteen. I'm going to move to section twenty, which is on which is called his justice and trustworthiness. Decency and truthfulness. He says the Prophet ﷺ was the most uh, trustworthy, just, decent, and truthful of people. But even his opponents and enemies admitted that. He was called Al Amin, a Sadiq al Amin, even before he was a prophet, or even before he was commissioned as a prophet, or you can say even before uh, this, the descent of the Quran, because the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was a prophet uh, in, when Adam is between. Ruh wal jasad, according to the hadith, between soul and body. So even if, so, here we're talking about before the commissioning um, of his nabuwa, which was in the year six ten of the common era. Ibn Ishaq said he's called Al Amin because of his sound qualities, which Allah had concentrated in him. And Allah said, and he quotes these ayat again from Surah Al Taqwir: Inna hu la qawlu rasulin kareem. The quwwatin inda dil arshi makin. That indeed this is the word or the speech of a noble messenger, possessing strength before the possessor of the throne of high rank. Muta'in thamma amin. Obeyed then trustworthy. Most, he says, Qadi Iyad says, most of the commentators say that this Rasul refers to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and some, and Imam Qurtubi mentions this as well in his tafsir, uh, and some say Jibreel alayhi salam. So he's obeyed, right? Muta'in means obeyed, right? He must be obeyed or else one does not become Muslim. Part, again, part and parcel of becoming a Muslim is to obey the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا الشَّجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتْ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا So again, the perennial philosophy, these people who, who, uh, who have infiltrated academic circles um, and um, give this strange interpretation to the Qur'an uh, they really have nothing to stand upon by your Lord. They don't really believe, right? Until you, they make you a judge in all of their affairs and you find no resistance, they find no resistance in their hearts uh, to your judgments and they come to you in total submission, right? And that the Prophet is the obeyed Prophet. He must be obeyed. If one disobeys the Prophet ﷺ, such a person is not considered to be a Muslim. This is absolutely fundamental. This, you would think, is very axiomatic, very basic, um, very uh, um, common sense, commonsensical. When Quraysh disagreed and formed factions about who would put the black stone in its place when the Kaaba was being rebuilt, they decided that the first man who would, who would uh, come into the haram would be the judge, right? So this is a reference, of course, we read in the Sirah, there was something that happened to the Kaaba. Some sources say there was a flood that damaged the Kaaba and dislodged at Hajar al-Aswad, the black stone. Others say that the Quraysh were renovating the Kaaba. Allahu alam, this happened around the year 605 of the common era. And so the clans of the Quraysh, um, there was almost a war over who is going to replace the black stone. And so the leaders of the Quraysh, they met in the city council, if you will, the Dar al-Nidwa, and Al-Walid ibn Mughira, he decided that the first man to walk into the haram would be the judge. And of course, the Prophet wasallam he walks into the haram, and the Prophet is only 35 years old, and you needed to be 40 years old to serve on the council, uh, but this did not 
preclude the members of the council from from making him their judge. And in fact, in fact, they were quite uh, delighted when they saw him opening, when they saw him coming through the gate, and they began to shout, "Sadiq al-Amin, Hada Muhammad, Sadiq al-Amin." So they made him uh, their judge. It is said that Al Ahnas ibn Shuraiq met Abu Jahal on the day of Badr and he said to him, Abu al Hakam, there is no one here to hear what we say. Tell me about Muhammad. Does he tell the truth or is he a liar? And Abu Jahal said, By Allah, Muhammad is a truthful man and he never lies. And uh, obviously, somehow this statement reached us from Abu Jahal, if it's an authentic statement. It's not cited here by the uh, translator. Uh, but the point here is that they knew his character. The mushrikeen, they knew his character. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, which is a dalil qat'i, uh, which is mutawatir, that he's, Allah commands the Prophet to say, لَقَدْ لَبِثْتُ فِيكُمْ عُمْرًا مِنْ قَبْلِهِ Indeed, I have lived an entire lifetime, 40 years. Uh, you know, do I do I make up stuff? Am I a liar? Do you know me to be a liar? Do you know me to be a sahir, a sorcerer? Am I a sha'ir? Am I a poet? You know, um, you know, how is my reputation, basically? And we talked about this also in previous sessions, that a man's reputation is very, very important. You could follow him potentially for the rest of his life. If somebody makes toba and they move on, right? And obviously we shouldn't dredge up people's past. We should always oh, sort of um, uh, just assume that this person has made toba and don't and don't talk about a person's past transgressions. But but those memories are always going to be there. And if one is a prophet, a prophet has enemies, and those enemies will not uh, uh, will not miss an opportunity to bring up things from the past. Um, like when uh, Musa alayhi salam, remember he was in the court of the Pharaoh, and he said, remember you did that thing, that thing that you did? And he doesn't, you can almost see him sort of going, remember you, remember that thing? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell the other people, but, you know, just to let you know I have some leverage over you, if I, I, I'll tell these people you killed an Egyptian, and then how are you going to look? And of course, Musa alayhi salam did not intentionally kill the Egyptian, we covered that in previous sessions. When Musa Alayhi's intention was to break up a fight, he punched the man with his fist. He didn't stab him or something, like throw him off a cliff. Nothing like that. Nothing like the biblical version where it seems like he did have intent to kill the man and then he buried his body in the sand. Musa Alayhi Salaam struck the man, he happened to die. So he makes toba to Allah because of a lack of restraint. He lost his temper, right? And the man happened to die. Certainly his intention was not to kill the man. It's more manslaughter than any type of murder. Now, <clears throat> so, the, you know, they knew his reputation. And the Ahl al-Kitab, they knew him as well. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah number 6, Ayah number 20 of the Quran, الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَعْرِفُونَهُ كُمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ Those to whom we gave the Kitab, the revelation, could mean the Bible here. The word Bible means... The word Bible means kitab, biblion means book. Those to whom we gave the Bible or book or revelation in general before, they know him, ya'rifunahu, right? And ma'rifa or irfan is a higher type of, of gnosis. It's more of an intimate type of knowledge that they knew the Prophet intimately, as just as they know one of their own sons, the Quran says, right? So when the Prophet ﷺ came into Medina to Munawwara, uh, a Jewish man, um, he was first spotted by the Jews standing on their roofs. And then a Jewish man named Abdullah ibn Salam, who would later become a Muslim, anhu, he said, Araftu anna wajhu laysa bi I can tell from his face. Araftu means to recognize, recognition, right? I recognized his face. I recognized that his face wasn't the face of a liar. So, so the ulama say that it's possible that the Prophet Sallallahu just had an honest face. And others say that, in fact, Abdullah ibn Salam, he recognized the description of the Prophet Sallallahu because he was described in Jewish sacred text. So they knew him as well, and they knew his character.
Like we mentioned in the past, Isaiah chapter 42, probably a very good candidate for what uh, Abdullah ibn Salam was referring to. Heraclius, the emperor of Byzantium, once had Abu Sufyan in his court, and he asked Abu Sufyan about the Prophet And so he said to Abu Sufyan, did you suspect him of being a liar before he said what he said? In other words, before claiming prophecy. And Abu Sufyan said, no, we did not suspect him of being a liar. Another Ibn Harith said, that, said to Quraysh, when Muhammad was a young man <clears throat> among you, he was the most pleasing, truthful, and trustworthy <clears throat> of you until he had white hairs on his temples and he brought you what he brought you. Then you said, a magician. No, by Allah, he is not a magician. One hadith says that the, the hand of the Prophet ﷺ never touched a woman over whom he did not have rights. In hadith in Bukhari and Muslim from Aisha, she said, Ma masat yadu Rasulillahi yadu imra'atin qat. That the, the hand of the Prophet ﷺ did not touch a woman ever um, unless he had rights over that woman. Sayyidina Ali describes him by saying he was the most, most truthful of human beings. Abu Jafar al-Tabari mentioned that Ali said, that the Prophet said, I was never attracted to anything that the people of the Jahiliyyah used to do, except on two occasions. It was mentioned by the writers of Sira. And he says, both times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came between me and what I wanted to do. Ever since Allah has honored me with the message, I have never even considered doing anything like that. So one night I asked a slave boy who was herding with me if he would watch the sheep for me while I went to Mecca to spend the night as the young men spend the night. I went out to do so. When I came to the first house of Mecca, I heard flutes and drums playing for someone's marriage. And I sat down to watch and was suddenly overcome with sleep and only woke up after sunrise. So to so watching this frivolous uh, behavior and suddenly he basically falls unconscious and the the heat of the sun on his back actually woke him up. And he said, I went back without having done anything. The same thing happened another time. I have not considered doing anything like that uh, since. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him from birth to death, right? And that's why we have uh, these pre-commissioning miracles before his bi'atha, before his commissioning. There are, there are miracles called irhas. These are a type of mu'jizat, but before the bi'atha that are attributed to the Prophet ﷺ. For example, the Prophet ﷺ, when he was in his uh, early 20s probably, he went on a business trip with Maysara, a servant of Khadijah, to Bostra in Syria, and there was a monk there, Nestorius, and the Prophet ﷺ, he sat beneath a tree there, and uh, Nestorius was looking at him in amazement, and uh, he took he grabbed Maysara and he said, who is this man under the tree? And Maysara said, he's a man of, of the Quraysh, one of the protectors of the Kaaba, the house of God. And Nestorius said, there's none other than a prophet seated beneath the tree. And then Mesara looked and some of the veils had been lifted and he noticed that there were two angels flanking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's many stories like this. Of course, we know years earlier in the same place in Bostra, when the Prophet was 10 or 12 years old with Abu Talib, Bahira the monk noticed strange phenomena as well, supernatural type phenomena. This is an indication that the Prophet, um, his, um, his demeanor, his character, his actions um, were always protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Section 21, his sedateness, silence, deliberation, manly virtue, and excellent conduct. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz ibn Wahhab heard uh, Kharija ibn Zayd said that the Prophet ﷺ was the most sedate of people in the assembly. He almost never moved his limbs. 
so there was a tranquility about him, Salalati Salam. You know, sometimes you see people and they're jittery and they're tapping their knees and legs and, you know, they can't sit still. There's something, there's something off about him. The Prophet Salalati Salam was very tranquil, almost like he was in a meditative uh, state. Um, one can say that his heart was always in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in sleep. He said, Aineya, Aineya tanamani walaya namu qalbi. He said that my eyes sleep, but my heart is always awake, that his heart was uh, continuously raptured in the presence uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he's related to the Prophet sallallahu sat in an assembly. He sat with his legs pulled up against his stomach by his hands. This is how he sat most of the time. And Jabir ibn Samura said that he sat cross-legged, like uh, in what's called the lotus position. It used to be called Indian style, but it's not politically correct anymore to say that. Now it's called the lotus position. And sometimes he sat squatting. This is also mentioned in the hadith of Qayla. He was, often, he was often silent and did not speak except when necessary, avoiding people who did not speak well. So we mentioned this in the past as well, and Qadi Iyad mentioned it in passing, that the Prophet ﷺ was quite taciturn in his speech, meaning he didn't speak, um, he didn't speak much at all unless it was unless it was necessary. And of course, we have multiple hadith that uh, that highlight the the excellence of the virtue of of silence, not taking vows of silence. That's considered a bid'ah to take a vow of silence. It's something that the previous Ummam did uh, as, um, as a type of vow mentioned in Surah Maryam. Uh, that she did that. She took a vow of silence as well as Zakariya alayhi salam. But this practice has been abrogated. Um, so, so there's many, many hadith that, that, that highlight the, the virtue of, of speaking little, right? Um, Whoever believes um, uh, in Allah and His Messenger uh, should say what is good or be silent. Say good things or be silent. And, you know, that doesn't mean you can't criticize because, some, because if, it's, if it's criticizing with a good intention and with adab, then that's good. That's good speech. Sometimes people or we need to need to be criticized. So it's not saying just say all good flowery things, and if not, then shut your mouth. No. If you're going to criticize, if you're going to raise an issue of some sort, defend something, do it in the best manner, right? Um, of course, man samata naja, the Prophet said um, that, uh, that uh, whoever uh, is silent is safe. Right. Of course, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu whoever can guarantee for me the proper usage of that which is between his jaws and that which is between his hips, meaning his private parts, then I can guarantee for him entrance into Jannah. Right? Entrance into Jannah. Right? Controlling what you say and controlling your shahwa, your promiscuity. Right? And this is an age we're living in Right, it used to be the pre-modern age where people had restraint and people knew things. And it, of course, we're not going to romanticize the pre-modern world. It was also extremely violent and in many ways as well, and and uh, and problematic. But people generally, their epistemology consisted of naql and akal, right? Of revelation and reason, and these things worked together. Nur and ala nur, as we said. We move into the modern age. And naql is completely thrown away, and everything is aql, everything's rationalism. In fact, a type of empiricism uh, really is what it is. Um, a rigid type of imperial, uh, empiricism that if you can't prove it scientifically, you can't see it or smell it or taste it, touch it, then it doesn't exist. And then we move into the postmodern age where it's, there's no truth. You can't take this. So it's not truth from knuckle and akal. That's the pre-modern world. Truth is not taken from science, materialistic, mechanistic, like Newtonian physics. That's the modern world. 
Now, the postmodern world is there's no truth, capital T, and it's your truth, whatever you want to be true, and it's taken from feelings. It's how you feel. So you feel, if you're a man and you feel like you're a woman, then you're a woman. You know, it's all based on feelings now. Very, very strange time we're living in. But postmodernists and Satanists have something in common. Do what thou wilt. That's what Aleister Crowley says in the Liber Leges, the book of the law, which he contends was a satanic revelation uh, revealed to him from some demon um, and that's the entire law, it says. This is what this demon revealed to Crowley. Do whatever you want. Do what, do, do what thou will shall be the whole of the law. The Prophet wasallam says in a hadith recorded by Imam al nawawi in the Arba'in, he said, all of the prophets, all of the prophets said to their people, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحْيِي فَاسْنَعْمَ شِئْتَ أو كما قال, that if you don't have shame, then do what thou wilt. So the meaning of this hadith isn't, okay, I don't have shame, I can do whatever I want. No, you should have shame. That's the point of the hadith. You can't do whatever you want. Um, but they always add this caveat, like people who live a promiscuous lifestyle, people who laugh at traditional morality, or, you know, um, marriage and, you know, just, you know, relax. What is this, um, uh, um, you know, relationships only only in the confines of marriage. It's time, that's, you know, that's caveman stuff. It's time to come into the new century, man. You're not woke anymore. You need to get woke and, you know, uh, leave these archaic, divisive, traditional values behind. Well, you know, so these people are very promiscuous and promiscuity, this is something that science has proven promiscuity in many, many studies leads to an epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases. It even increases cancer risks. Um, multiple studies have linked promiscuity with clinical depression, because that's what they say. Do whatever you want, engage in any type of debauchery you want to, and they always add the caveat, as long as you don't hurt anybody, as long as you're not hurting anybody, how do you know you're not hurting anybody? Live, live, living a, prom a promiscuous lifestyle, multiple studies have shown, brings STDs, brings cancer, brings, uh, as we said, clinical depression, suicide, suicidality, which leads to, to domestic violence. Pr promiscuity leads to, to, to in, an increase in domestic violence, which leads to an increase of traumatic childhood for many, many children, which leads to mental illness and many of those children who become adults and it's a vicious cycle it's all based on promiscuity people can't control what they're looking at people can't control what's in their between their hips as the prophet sallallahu said right how do you know you're not hurting anybody how do we know because we believe in revelation in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim bi kulli shay'in alim allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows ultimately what is good for us. Okay. His laughter was a smile, and his statements were incisive, neither too long nor too short. His companions smiled rather than laughed in his presence out of respect for him and to imitate him. His, assemblies, uh, his assembly was one of forbearance, modesty, good feelings, and trust. Voices were not raised in it, and disrespect to sacred things did not arise in it. When he spoke, his companions bowed their heads in silence, as if birds were perching on them. So this is how they were completely raptured in the words of the Prophet ﷺ, that when, when he spoke, they would, their heads would, would go down as if, as if they were statues, as if birds would come and perch upon them. And this is something else that's, that's lost. People, you know, because... There are, again, these kind of postmodernists, many of them Marxists, communists, that want to equalize all of society, that we're all exactly the same. There's no differences whatsoever. So they want to destroy every type of social hierarchy, even in academia. You know, you go to academia, you have these, these professors that show up with flip-flops and tank tops because they just want to be one of the guys, one of the, you know, one of the young 19-year-old students. This guy's like 60 years old and He's dressed like a 19-year-old and call me Bob, you know, forget about teacher or doctor, this and that. Just call me Bob and 
this type of thing. Um, and this is dangerous because hierarchies work and history has shown that hierarchies, social hierarchies, they tend to work and they work in the workplace. They tend they work in the family. It leads to healthy types of interactions between peoples. Um, and they just simply work, right? And this, this leveling of society, everyone's exactly equal. I mean, they've tried this in many countries and uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work at all, right? And so the Sahaba, they, they knew, they knew the, the rules of the game. They knew who, who he was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they knew that when they, went, when they were in his presence, it was not like in the presence of another one of them. They knew that this was the messenger of God. and He outranks all of creation. And he would act uh, in his presence accordingly. Breaching adab, right, with, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, is as if one is breaching adab with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So we treat people according to their ranks. And this is a good way of dealing with people. The Prophet ﷺ, treat people according to their ranks. This is also something that Confucius taught. He said, if, if, you, if you treat everyone with compassion, you treat everyone the same, then you waste your compassion. And at the end of the day, you're not compassionate to anybody. He says, one of the things that it is said about him is that he walked inclining forward, like he was walking down a slope. In another hadith, when he walked, he walked with concentration. He was known neither to press forward nor falter in his gait, i.e., he was never, he was neither impatient nor feeble. So the Prophet wasallam, he would walk with an intention, right? Luqman al-Hakim, he gave advice to his son, waqsid fi mashik, waqdud min sawtik, Right, walk, and some have translated this like walk moderately, a moderate pace, but it also can mean walk with an intention. Walk uh, with, with, um, with, with uh, a clarity in your mind that you know exactly where you're going and don't let anything distract you. Right? Walk sid fi mashiq, waghdud min sotik, just to finish that second part of that statement in the Quran, and lower your voice. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said, the best conduct is that of the Prophet ﷺ. Jabir ibn Abdullah said, the words of the Prophet ﷺ contained both elegant phrasing and easy flow. This hadith is in Abu Dawood. And we gave you already several examples in a previous class of uh, some hadith and looked at the absolutely exquisite rhetorical composition uh, of those hadith, demonstrating the unbelievable eloquence of, of the normal speech we're not talking about Quran. Quran is on a whole different level. We're just talking about the normal everyday speech of the Prophet ﷺ, which again is also a type of wahi. Everything the Prophet said uh, is um, is revelation. وَمَا يَنْتِفُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوحَىٰ عَلَّمَهُ شَدِيدُ الْقُوَىٰ So uh, it's 7 o'clock now, so جزاكالله um, خيران I encourage you to um, continue in your education of the Prophet of Allah um, and remember and memorize many of these iconic verses in the Quran. Remember, we said twenty-one, one hundred seven, right? You have to, you have to memorize this ayah. Look at the tafsir, uh, thirty-three, twenty-one, thirty-three, sixty-three, thirty-three, forty, sixty-eight, four. Um, uh, chapter 6 verse 20 verse chapter 7 verse 157 all of these beautiful uh, chapter 3 verse verse 159 uh, describing the character of the Prophet Sallam, the rank of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, the, uh, the, the beautiful attributes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala speaks about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this is how we get to know him our primary source the Quran and, and many of those hadith we mentioned as well um, the hadith of Rahma, the hadith of his mastery over the children of Adam, these are things that every one of us should have memorized uh, so that when an opportunity presents itself to somebody, we can explain and, and present uh, accurately uh, the Habib, the, the, the best of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So please keep us in your dua that you have a beautiful um, rest of your Ramadan. Uh, may you catch the night of power. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
give you a very joyous uh, Eid uh, and increase you and increase your family. I mean, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad wa Alihi wa Sahih wa Sallam, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Wassalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh.